Hello everyone and welcome to another Pretentious Ingredients episode. Now today is a very special day because we have both a normal and a chef in the hot seats, which means we get all perspectives. Double whammy. All right, boys. Number one, lift the cloche. Please. No, I, I feel like you're Prince Fine. of Pretentious. I've taken that title and I'm proud of it. Oh, straight off. Purple potatoes. You know, I've seen these before. I think what I love about exploring new spuds is that we begin to ex kind of expand our repertoire. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of species of spud from the Andes, and we only cook with about four or five of them. These are different. You're backing yourself on potatoes, then? Yep. Well, boys, you're absolutely right. These are potatoes, but these are vitalote potatoes. Originally from Peru and Bolivia, They've been cultivated in France since the 1850s as a gourmet delicacy. In Germany, they're also known as truffle potato. All of what you just said was new to me apart from the purple potato bit. Yeah, I'd have said the same. Vitalotte I've never heard of, but the idea of cultivating new potatoes in the late 1800s... Something you used to do? Very familiar <laughs> territory, especially in France. <laughs> I remember halfway up the Andes along an Inca trail, a community of people who are there to look after ancient varieties of potato. These are very rare and therefore highly valued potatoes, combined with their amazing taste and vibrant colour and their limited supply is why they're being featured on this particular format. Question is, should we taste some? It's not potato coloured. No, far from it. That is not what I was expecting. What I've been told by the food team is that they prepared you a purple potato salad with creme fraiche. Nice. It's a cross between waxy and fluffy. So some of the edges are a little bit fluffy, but it's a mostly a waxy potato. Are you tasting any difference to a normal potato? It's confusing me on what I'm tasting. I'm almost looking to taste the colour, but I can't find it. I know what you mean. You're expecting something different. If I ate this with my eyes closed, I'd say that is a deliciously seasoned potato salad. It's cold and it is a combination of textures from yeah. some that's mashed just enough to bind it, some still chunky, waxy, a little bit floury. It's kind of a combination of the two. Mm. It's kind of got Jersey Royal vibes in, it, in its flavor. You know when you cook them, you steam them and they taste buttery before you mm. put the butter mm. on. It's quite, feels fresh, feels light for a pile of potato. And maybe the colour lends to that maybe, because yeah. it kind of looks almost mythical. Mm. Does anything about these potatoes shout out to you as being pretentious? Only comparison I have to these are things like heritage tomatoes. In a salad look amazing. They taste and smell extra tomato-y because they're on the vine, they're super fresh. Um, and they're not pretentious. I don't think this is either. How much do you think we paid for a two kilogram bag of vitalote potatoes? I mean, I reckon for two kilos of these, we're thinking about their rarity, the fact they've almost been cultivated back from the past. I would say you could happily pay seven pounds for it. I'm going to go a little bit lower and go like six. 12 pounds, 95. Holy. So I'm closest, do I get a point? Is you get a point, Evans, yeah, fine. <laughs> We've just invented that, well done. In terms of how they're sourced and the story, that makes sense. I've recently read a book by a guy called Dan, and it's called Eating to Extinction. And it is all about things, special ingredients or dishes that should be preserved because they're trying to almost create a living museum of food and bring certain traditions back to life. So I, I, my 12 pounds is a contribution towards that. However, I'm going to have to ask you whether <laughs> vitalote potatoes, are they pretentious or not? Are they everyday ingredients? No. Are they pretentious? No more than walking into an art gallery and looking at artwork that's been preserved. So no. All Barry's thinking. All that aside, <laughs> at the end of the day, it tastes like potato. You're paying a lot of money for a purple one. Pretentious. Ooh, and that's why we have a chef and a You're allowed to think that? <laughs> you're wrong, but you're allowed to think it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to number two. We're here now. Hello. Number two, lift the cloche. We're back to our favourite unidentifiable powders in a clear glass bowl. It looks like a cross between a spice mix, sugar and bee pollen. That's what it looks like. What does it smell like? Just like Biscoff. Very, very yeasty. Very salty. It is miso crumb. That right. sounds pretentious, but it would be on a menu. <laughs> it reminds me of caramelised white chocolate, that bitterness from that. 
but with miso. If I had a perfectly baked piece of white fish, I would want to sprinkle that on top and it would be absolutely delicious. This is Nobu's miso powder. So Japanese chef Nobuyuki Matsuhisa, chef and restaurateur known for Japanese and Peruvian cuisines done as fusion. Well, they reckon that it enrich the savory flavors of meat and fish and makes it easy to take everyday dinners to the next level. I like it on cheese and toast. Yeah, that's, that's yes. it. Yes, yeah. And there's the line. <laughs> it takes a while because it starts salty and you've yeah, got to yeah. wait for it to literally hydrate in your mouth and you're like, ooh, miso paste. My favourite thing that I've learned about miso recently is that it burns very easily. So you can't cook with it, you can't, don't marinate in it, don't cook in it, but use it later towards the end of the cooking process. You do burn most things easily. This is the signature Nobu seasoning. Um, it actually made its way into the first Nobu cookbook all of those years ago uh, and has been used ever since. Mm. So Ebers, you said this uh, was white miso. It's actually a mixture of red and white miso. Uh, it's been oven dried and then blitzed to a powder. So the red miso brings the hearty, strong umami flavours, whilst the white is light and sweet. Would you like to taste it on something? Salmon sashimi, chives, garlic crisps, extra virgin olive oil, nobu miso powder. You've got that fresh fattiness mm. of the salmon, and then you've got the peppery fattiness of the olive oil. Not greasy, but it's got that fruitiness to it. And then you go in for miso, which is just umami and wraps it round in like a, a big cozy Japanese blanket. Yeah, fresh. Zingy, crunchy, bit slimy. It adds an earthiness to the dish. Like it's one of those things that we've used miso a lot recently in our psyche recipes, and now I can't stop using it. It's unbelievable, isn't it? It's the perfect normal shortcut I mm. find, which is mm. a bit of that in the right place at the right time, and it makes you cook better than you can. Well, they reckon that this powder, because it's dry, is perfect for a topping to a salad, or using as a dry rub on chicken or fish before you grill it. It loves mm. here the, the fish fat and the, um, the unsaturated fat of the mm. olive oil, but dairy fat, we know that miso and butter work nicely. It would also work on mash. It's a dream. It is the match made in heaven. Again, dairy fat, ice cream, panna cotta, Greek yogurt, it would lend itself to that as well. What I do think is really interesting is recently we've been learning a lot more about fermentation from Dr. Johnny Dre and the idea that you could ferment and make misos from other things other than soybeans. We made our own with chickpeas at one point. Could you make that paste, then dehydrate it, then crack it in a food processor to a crumb and suddenly take your cooking up there mm. with something that's relatively easy in principle but very difficult to perfect? Which leads us onto price. How much do you think we paid for the Nobu miso powder? £5.50. And I think for that pot, without the Nobu, I think I'd agree. Ooh. But I think with the added brand and trust that comes with that, I would go £7.50. We bought the Nobu miso powder for £19.99. pence. 20 quid. OK, that's a lot more expensive, but I was still closest. I get a point. <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> I think you could elevate a lot of more affordable ingredients and therefore spend the money on that. It is a lot, but I can see it. It's a fantastic product, but spending £19 on a pot of seasoning just seems, for me, for everyday cooking a step too far. For a special treat, maybe. <laughs> well, pretentious or not. It is not a pretentious idea. I nope. think it's genius. But if I saw it on a menu, I think miso crumb is pretentious. I think the price shifts it towards that. I'm going to say yes, pretentious. I agree, pretentious. It's, it's one that I say 100% pretentious, and I love it for every yeah. centimetre yeah. of its pretentiousness. Yeah, I agree. Boys, we're going to mix things up slightly here. Please do. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this product that's going to fill those glasses. So this product, founded 10 years ago by three visionaries from Chile, from the Patagonia region, which is South South America. Only 3,600 bottles produced a year. Why isn't he telling us what this thing is? He's changed the game a lot. Where's the cloche? Boys. <laughs> this is Apsu Premium 
single origin water. Okay, right. We're on board. We're good, we're good, we're good. This is by a company called Apsu. The mission of the company focuses on harvesting exclusive waters in Patagonia in small volume production, doing it in an environmentally friendly way. The harvesting not only is so difficult that they can't use traditional bottling methods, so they had to develop technology to identify these glacial springs, and they also use profits to raise funds to support social projects in Chile. The source for the water is glacier water from Gran Campo Nevado in sub-Antarctic Chilean Patagonia. We've, we've spoken about some details. Let's give it a try. Now, before you do anything, would you like to learn how to taste water. So traditionally, when you taste water, you actually taste it at room temperature. However, the particular source of these in Patagonia is around four degrees. So smell, taste, wash it around your mouth, and then swallow. Do you ever have that thing where you know when you freeze ice tap water and you put it into ice cube trays, and then just like suck on an ice cube? It has a kind of like freezer taste to it, doesn't it? You know what, I have closed my mind a little bit because there's like water is the most precious thing in the world next to light and it tastes delicious so I'm so thankful to better get it out of my tap purify it and have it at home I don't want it flown half around the world for me no matter how beautiful it might taste I kind of agree with you and I think what is genius here is that they have marketed it to a niche demographic who are prepared to pay silly amounts of money for it, I presume, and some of that money is then taken and put back into projects that are helping support a very changing world. I, so I, I genuinely do think water tastes different. If you have water at home that you're used to, if you go on holiday to another part of the country, go up to the Midlands, taste it, have one from London, they will taste different. Like wine, like coffee, like tea, it has a terroir attached to it it tastes of the geology of the region. Final thing to note is that it pairs really well with food. An awesome pairing is chocolate. So there you have some 85% chocolate. So, so that is very, very oh. dry, bitter, but fruity. Single very. origin, 85%. Mm -hmm. Very slow melt. No, I don't feel like it's What do you expect me to say? I just want to know, that's all. All we're doing is asking a question today. So, but it felt like you decided before you even tried. I'm trying, I'm drinking it. I'm trying to taste anything other than just fresh, lovely water. Water sommeliers has been a thing for a couple of years now. I remember reading about it and I remember sitting on Barry's side of the fence back then and thinking that is just ridiculous. But the more I read about it and the more I understood it, I realised it is no different to talking about different salts, different chocolates, different tea. It is all about the local area, the quite literally terroir of a product, but it tastes yummy. How much do you think I paid for that one bottle? I think that bottle of water is probably something extortionate like 40 pounds. Four zero? To justify all of the pretentiousness we've just heard. I need to get a point here. 41 pounds. Think of the embossing. This bottle of water cost us 140 euros, which comes out at about 120 pounds. I'm logging you out of our account. You can't keep spending money on this For stuff. the sake of conversation and learning. I'm not saying it's a good purchase. I'm just saying, look at what, look at what we're experiencing through it. Let's not beat around the bush, Ebers, pretentious or not? Correct, pretentious. I kind of like it. <laughs> I don't like it as a product. I kind of admire what the founders have done. I, I feel like I'm obviously coming across quite harshly here. Everything about that is pretentious. I'll get sign off on the next ones. Number four. <laughs> <laughs> Lift the cloche on number four. Oh, hello. <laughs> Looks salty, smells sugary. That is both salty and sugary. It's got the wonderful, soft, flaky crunch of sea salt. He's annoyed because he thinks he might be, I might be right. I've taken his, I've taken his lime right. It's salt and demerara sugar. It's not demerara sugar. Who's going to get it? What would you want to buy? Put him down. I mean, put Something him out of his like <laughs> Bertie. Licorice. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the black bit, yeah, yeah. It's licorice sea salt. End. This is licorice salt. Is this also from somewhere like 
Come on then. Iceland or Northern Scandi? Is it like a Norwegian fjord meets licorice? Saltworks Icelandic Flake Salt is the world's only artisan salt produced with 100% geothermal energy and one of the best flake salts available, making it the flake salt of choice for consumers looking for excellent salt made in an environmentally sustainable way. And in, in Iceland, one of the only sweet options because nothing will pollinate in Iceland, so you don't get fresh fruit for sweetness or honey, you just get the sweetness of roots, and in particular, licorice. I'm a little bit confused by the geothermal salt making process. He sets them up, you knock them out of the car. Well, I shall do. Their salt making method is actually based on the 17th century method that was practiced in Ricky Yanes. The flaky sea salt are handmade pyramid-like crystal salt flakes that contain the flavor and the taste of the Nordic region from which the raw materials used in it derive. I'd love to see this sprinkle on a bit of Icelandic lamb. Yes, Kush, bring in the dish. Or ice cream. Yep. <laughs> the first part of that was correct. Ice cream. Right, should we sprinkle? Seriously, would you ever sprinkle salt on your ice cream at home? Barry, why are you changed? asking us? What's happened to you? No, I wouldn't. Why would you? you people don't do that. Why, Ooh, I don't know nice. this guy. I prefer Barry with the long hair. <laughs> yeah. I like, I like yeah. Barry with the good hair. <laughs> I think it's very Ooh, good. It's very clever. It's creamy, it's sweet, it's vanilla -y. The salt and the licorice does help. I never liked licorice growing up, but like in this, in this mixture, you get all the best bits of licorice without that, that aftertaste. It's subtle enough for us to yeah. know that it's there. I'd like to some, um, some miso dust on my ice cream. I think the miso, mm. I actually prefer in that environment mm. because oh, of the dairy yeah. fat, that's really good. What's interesting for me is how you can take, I'm guessing, bog standard vanilla ice cream mm -hmm. and you can flavour it with a pinch. I think it does absolutely work with the sweet. I think it would also be really interesting on a number of savoury dishes. It would equally work really nicely with roasted roots, so stick to the things that grow under the ground, but beetroot that has that sweetness, that the, the, the parsnip. How much do you think Mike spent of his own holiday money. I did because I lost the receipt. Licorice salt. Eight pounds worth. And I imagine it's lined up with lots of other. I'm going like... to say ten pounds. I'm going to say twelve pounds. <laughs> I'm going to say nine pound eighty. <laughs> Mike actually paid eight pound sixty. Three one. Turns out you're not as pretentious as you think. Is it pretentious? No, I don't think so. It does exactly what it says on the tin, uh, and you can only get it there in the world, and it's a unique flavour. I actually like it. I think it's a little slice of a country that you can bring home and continue to taste mm -hmm. in a number of different ways. Good gift market, not pretentious. I like it. All right, well, over to you. List down in the comments, one to four, pretentious or not, and tell us why. And also, please give us a like, because we've got to pay for that water. <laughs>